Bonjour. Soyez Bonjour. bienvenue. Hey, Martin, bonsoir. <laughs> bonsoir. Bonsoir. And bonsoir from Balzac as well. There's Balzac. Oh, c'est un, un beau chien, n'est-ce pas? Oui, il est très, très beau. Il est magnifique, ce petit chien. <laughs> Indeed. He's lovely. Well, it's wonderful to see you. I dressed in wine color just for you, but unfortunately, well, since I it's... brought along a bottle of my own wine, the Cuvée Bruno. I love and it. And you can see the label. On the label is Balzac wearing a policeman's KP. I do see and it. And Balzac knows this wine very well, or at least he knows, he knows the shape of the bottle. Well, and uh, this is a wine I make myself. You do. In fact, you have um, you have serious creds as a wine person there in the Perigord, <laughs> don't you? Why aren't you wearing yeah. your full robe? Well, because it's so bloody hot. <laughs> <laughs> they are they are very uh, they're very weighty, and it's um, but I I've got some of my wine here to keep me going while we chat. All right. And, uh, so here's to you. And here's to you. Okay. Wonderful. Well, Barbara, thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. Of course, this is the official publication day, I believe, of um, the shooting at Chateau Rock in the US. Actually, it's tomorrow. Oh, okay. So we well, are. Here we are we've got. This is the virtual launch of your book, which is very exciting. Wonderful. And I'd like to say for those of you watching that Balzac is the star. Um, we have made a postcard featuring Balzac and the cover of Chateau Rock, which every one of our copies of the shooting at Chateau Rock comes with. So they're here and ready for you to order, and then you too can admire Balzac, the Basset Hound. <laughs> I'm really glad you sent me a photo of Balzac. So, All right, so He's Martin, a wonderful dog. He is a wonderful dog. Um, before, before we talk about the book, catch us up about what life has been like for you. You've been locked down there in the middle of France for quite some time two and a half months now um, and what was worse is that I was I mean I, I flew into France in the beginning of March and when the lockdown came I was here but Julia my wife was stuck in London and she's been in lockdown in London ever since and not being a member of the government who managed to break the rules all the time she has been following the rules and it now turns out that if we were to come together if Julia flew into France, she would have to spend 14 days in an airport airport hotel in quarantine. And when she went back to Britain, she'd spend another 14 days in an airport hotel in quarantine. And I would do the same if I were to go back to Britain. It is, they're completely insane, these, this, this, the, the British government on these particular rules. And uh, the French originally said, look, we're quite happy for Brits and French to go back and forth together if they're clearly not infectious. Uh, but then the British government became rather foolish about this. So it's a problem that we have. And Lord knows when I will see Julia again. I'm hoping in the middle of June things will relax a bit. You know, you've answered a question that I've had when reading about this, is that where, in fact, would you quarantine? And I hadn't considered the airport hotels had enough capacity for all that. I'm not sure they do, but there are only three flights a day from France to the whole of the UK. There's one, two to London and one to Scotland. And um, they've really cut down upon travel. I mean, it's been, I mean, I've, I have not been able to believe my eyes when I've seen some of the photographs of beaches this weekend, Memorial Day weekend in the States, uh, seem to be pretty much full. Whereas in, in, in London, the streets are still empty. Here in this part of France, although we've had very few cases in the Perigord, um, people are, broadly speaking, have been obeying the rules. Well, we have we have all sorts of problems starting at the top here in America and filtering <laughs> down. That's all I'm saying. Um, with and and you know, I was out yesterday in Scottsdale, um, and I observed I me mean, driving, and I didn't see anybody wearing a mask. So it seems to me that somehow in America, the idea that the lockdown is lifted seems to indicate to too many people that the virus went away and is perfectly safe. And, you know, I'm, I'm personally expecting a second wave of 
rather large proportions, but you know, well, we'll see. Well, well, I fear that I am as well, and I, I also, when looking back, we know that there is so far still no single vaccine against HIV, and that's been nearly 40 years now. So there's no guarantee we're going to get a vaccine for this soon. No, I don't think so. And you know, you and I are of an age where we probably have, at least I have, been vaccinated against absolutely everything. I've been vaccinated twice against smallpox and, you know, all of the childhood diseases now because that's what happened when, when we were young. And if you wanted to travel, um, my first trip to Europe was in 1955 and I had to be revaccinated for smallpox. Oh, indeed. I remember when I first came to the States, I'm, I had a swollen arm from the number of injections I had to have to be sure that they were all up to date. Well, but, the shooting... Uh, things change. Sorry, the mm -hmm. shooting at Chateau Rock takes place in happier times, so <laughs> let's talk about <laughs> it that. It does. Pe people have asked me, I, do I plan to write uh, a COVID-19 version of Bruno? And I think, well, by the time I write it, it should be either over or people will be bored with it. So. I think I think we'll keep the uh, we'll keep the Bezer Valley as a COVID-free zone, and in fact, where the town where near which I live, of Le Bug, and the next door towns of Saint is Saint Cyprien and Les Aizy, we have not had a single case of COVID-19, not one. Well, I have visited Les Aizy, if you recall. Though I didn't, we didn't yeah. spend any time together. Um, my husband and I spent five weeks right there in your area. Yeah which is absolutely gorgeous. So maybe we should, before we talk about Chateau Rock, um, talk about some of the highlights of the Vezer Valley because the chateau are a very prominent feature at the, you know, I can still see the ruins of one and then Josephine Baker's over on one side and then on the That's other side. Yeah, and on the other we, side. We, yeah. We're known as the, uh, the, the, the valleys of the Vezer River and the Dordogne River. They're known as the valleys of a thousand and one chateau. And most of them are medieval fortresses because this was a war zone uh, between the English and the French in the Middle Ages for centuries. Um, there are some Renaissance style chateaux, like the beautiful one called Hautefort. But uh, near me, there are a whole series of chateaus, some of them very old indeed. So at Limoy, there is one that dates back to Iron Age times, and we know that Julius Caesar's legions stormed it as a, an Iron Age hill fort. And then, of course, it was rebuilt by Charlemagne as a fortress against the Vikings, and then rebuilt by the English and rebuilt by the French. It was just it kept being taken back and forth. So you can't move with these chateaus. And one of the reasons, one of the results of that is that this part of France became known for the Jacquerie. And the Jacquerie was like a peasant's revolt. Because if you think about it, if you have lots of chateaux, lots of fortresses, you will need lots of soldiers. Soldiers have to be fed, they have to be armed, they have to be paid. Who's going to pay it? The peasants. So the peasants got very cheesed off, century after century, of massive taxes to pay for all of these chateaus and all of these soldiers. So we, we really were the heartland of the, uh, of the French peasant rebellions. Indeed, one of them, a famous one, against Richelieu in the middle of the 17th century, uh, re they, they were blocking the main road for re French reinforcements down to Spain for the Spanish War. And uh, they, they managed to hold the, the fortress, rather, no, hold the forest, rather like Robin Hood. And even though Richelieu finished up sending over 5,000 men against them, he could not put down the civilian. And what he finally did was he bribed the head of the, uh, the Peasants' Revolt with the promise of being a knight and the head of a, of a fortress out on the Italian frontier and a free pardon for all of his men. He won, basically. And uh, we're very fond of him. And the classic novel, uh, the French novel of this region, is called Jacou le Croquant. And Jacou is the name of a, a son of a peasant, le Croquant, a crocker is a gnasher, like when you gnash your teeth, when you crock something. Um, and that was the word that they gave to these peasants who were revolting. So like we had Robin Hood and his merry men in England, the French had les croquants. And Jacques le croquant leads a rebellion against the local, against the local, uh, against the local baron. It's a, it's a very radical tradition in this part of the world. And that's one of the interesting features of it, because it's, uh, it's also 
It's also been hugely radical religion. It was the two great heresies in France, the Albigensians, the Cathars in the Middle Ages, and then the Huguenots, the Protestants in the 16th and 17th century. They were both based around here. And uh, we've still got a, a large number of Protestants living in the area. It's really, it's interesting to live in such a, an odd part of France because the longer I'm here, the more I realize that this is not really France, or not 100% France. It's much older than France. This is the center of prehistory. We've got, it's not just famous caves like Lascaux, which is what, 18,000 years old. But I can take a walk from where I live and I come to a, a rock shelter in the cliffs. That's the site of the world's oldest cemetery, 72,000 years old. The first time we know that human beings were buried with ritual and respect. Uh, and I just love the sense of history that we have here. I just find it fascinating. Well, it is fascinating. Um, the, the geography plays a great role in all of that because it's all limestone and therefore you had caves that were suitable for the Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon and so forth, um, you know, to, to shelter in. It's not, you know, we have a sort of similar thing, but not, not limestone. Well, maybe they are, but I think it's sandstone with Mesa Verde and some of the um, um, Pueblo runes, you know, up north yeah. here in Arizona. But and on the Che and so on, they're wonderful places, those, yeah. Well, they it's, are. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, what, I, what I find remarkable about, about the, the, the places around here is not just the, it's not just the limestone, it's also the rivers. The Romans called this area Aquitaine, the land of water, or the land of rivers, and it is, really quite remarkable how those rivers have defined the economy, the trading system. I mean, France really never had good roads. And until the railway came in the 1860s, it was eight or nine days to get to Paris from here on rotten roads. What people mainly traveled on were the rivers. And of course, the rivers carrying all of this trade were the perfect place for the nobles to put their castles so they could tax the trade. But the other thing about the rivers is that they constantly flooded until in the 1950s the French built several dams. And that flooding meant that those rivers became hugely wide every spring and autumn. So for the ducks and the geese, the migrating birds, this was like Saint-Tropez. I mean, they'd be flying over and think, oh, look at all that lovely water. Down they would come. And that is why ducks, geese and foie gras are such a classic part of the cuisine around here. It's also, I think, um, the local wine, to me, has always had a kind of a flinty taste. Not your red wine. I was thinking about the white wine, <laughs> anyway. Um, it does. It's, uh, it's famous for its dryness. It's, uh, uh, but equally, we also make very, very sweet ones with the noble rot, ones like Mombasiac and Sosignac. But um, the, I, I think it's fair to say that the, um, I mean, the, the, the wine that I make is, combines the four classic grapes of this region and of Bordeaux. It combines Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Malbec. Now, Malbec is the old, the famous black wine of the Cahors that they've been making since Roman times. And when Eleanor of Aquitaine married the future King Henry II of England in the year 1152, and thus starting the Anglo-French Wars, um, the... Uh, the wedding was celebrated with wine from Malbec, from Cahors, which we call Cot, and we still use it today. And it's got a, a particularly dark color, and it's got quite a, it's got a very rocky mineral flavor. And um, I rather like it. We even use, I even know some local vineyards who use this, uh, who use it in, uh, in their rosé wines, which is quite unusual. Yes, uh, Rosé, in fact, is no longer the sort of pink lemonade that it once was, but um, there are all kinds of different beautiful shades. Some of them are apricot. I think they're just gorgeous, and we get a lot of them. But, you know, it's funny you mentioned Malbec, because I always think of it as Argentinian in this country. Well, it is now, but originally it's, uh, it's from the Cajal region, which is very close to here. Well, your books have taken advantage of all of these wonderful local cuisine and local landscape features. I'm looking over here at Black Diamond, the truffle book. I always think of it as the truffle book, um, yeah. uh, the third one. And then Dark Vineyard, um, obviously, you know, plays upon the wines of the region. 
The Bobby in the Castle right. Well, which was last year's book, took advantage of the local fortresses, as you point out. So and she, Josephine Baker. And Josephine Baker, exactly. Yeah. What remind me again? I know you said it, but I, I, it went by quickly. What was the name of her? Is the name of her chateau? It's Chateau de Milan, and it's uh, it's a beautiful uh, classic uh, early Renaissance chateau. And it was it was built for romantic reasons. The Lord of Castelnau, which was a real medieval fortress, married a much much younger and very attractive bride. And she said to him, round about 1495, when they were newlyweds, she said, oh, darling, this boring old medieval fortress is so 12th century. We've got to have something new, like those trendy Italians down there with the Renaissance. And so he built her at the Chateau de Milan. Um, and it's a real little jewel. And it's uh, what I also like about it is that they have a wonderful museum of Josephine Baker. And I know the people who own it quite well. I, I go and have lunch with them. And uh, they, uh, as well as the Josephine Baker Museum, they have set up this extraordinary display of hunting birds, of raptors, of, you know, of hawks, peregrines, falcons, and so on. And they put on displays in the summer when there are tourists. But equally, those birds feed themselves. So there's a certain amount of tension with some of the local farmers who keep thinking that their, uh, their sheep might disappear or their lambs might disappear. But it's wonderful to see these birds. It really is. Oops. Whoa, we lost a book. Um, well, obviously it cried out to be included in a book. What's the name of the chateau, that, the ruined chateau that stands, you know, sort of at the head of the Vezere Valley when you're looking over there, down, down river or up river, perhaps? Well, there's, there, there, there are the two famous ones of Bainac and of Castelnau. And Bainac became famous because in the, in the film of Joan of Arc, that was the castle they used. And traditionally, Bainac was held by the French, and Castelnau, on the other side, was held by the English. And these two fortresses would glower at one another across the river. But the other, there's another one that I really adore, which I also used in a novel, The Templar's Last Secret, uh, which is the Chateau of Comarque. And uh, Comarque was actually founded by Charlemagne in the 790s uh, as a, a fortress against any more Arab raids and also against the increasing number of Viking raids. So the, uh, it's called Comarque because the man who was given the job of running it was known as the Count of the Marches, or in French, Comarque. And uh, it's... Uh, the same family now lives there and runs the place as a tourist centre, uh, direct descendants of the original Comarque who was anointed by Charlemagne. And it's uh, one of the things that's always struck me very powerfully is that uh, Hubert, who is the current Count of Comarque, who is somebody I know quite well, his father was not just uh, the Count of Comarque, he was mayor of the local village and he was one of the leading local resistance people in World War II. And he was arrested and shot by the Gestapo, taken to the concentration camp of Buchenwald. So what you have here is 12 centuries of this same family fighting for France. I just find that extraordinary, this length of time, this power of tradition in this part of the world. It cries out to be included in books. Is Balzac enjoying having his ears scratched? Yes, he is. <laughs> Can you hear him licking his chops? <laughs> I mentioned it because you keep moving around. I thought people who joined us might like to know that Martin is actually petting the dog and not having some yeah. sort of twitch. I was at my, at my feet and uh, I've got some food and water for him, but he'd rather sort of play around with my leg and so on. Who <laughs> could blame him? So what made you decide that it would be fun to bring a Scottish rocker to um, a chateau in France, I just love the juxtaposition of it and all of the music that is in this book, but it's not French music, it's really rocker, or no, sorry, that's the wrong thing, you educate me. Okay, well, I mean, it's back, I have to admit that back when the world was young, and I was young as well, back in the early 1970s, I spent some time as a rock music writer. Now, I was, I was a young reporter on The Guardian, the British paper, and I was writing mainly about politics and so on. But I went to the editor and I said, look, 
it's crazy we've got nothing in the newspaper about rock music which is by far the most important cultural phenomenon for people of my age and i think we ought to start doing something he said okay you do it but do it in your spare time you'll still have to write your politics and so on but if you want to write about rock and roll you go and do so so i found myself at the world premiere of dark side of the moon by pink by Pocal, by pink floyd at the london politarium i was on tour with purple harem uh, i interviewed mick jagger i uh, i was at the the launch of ziggy stardust and uh, and of david bowie i had a wonderful time uh, i even went to the great ball that mick jagger threw for bianca lenin <laughs> lenin palace so i i've always had this sort of passion for music of that particular period because when the punk generation came along i just felt that was it i was i was done i didn't want to go into that so i've always had this fondness for uh, for rock music and i thought well i knew that david gilmour of pink floyd had for a while lived in a chateau here in the Perigo. and so a couple of guys from other bands like 10 10 cc are still here so I thought, well, yes, okay, let's bring in this old rocker, much younger wife who wants a divorce. They decide with their kids to have a last summer together before they sell the place. And uh, the rocker, Rod McRae, has got his own recording studio at, the, at his chateau. And his son is studying classical music at the Royal College in London. And he comes over with a lot of his friends and they're all playing classical music in the, at the local concerts because throughout the summer we have these concerts taking place in every church and every town mainly of classical music mainly done by young students and i thought i'd bring all this together and then i'd also bring in some other themes like um, i i like, like the way in which i get very cross barbara when people mainly in brussels in the european union talk about this zone of peace that we have in europe I've been in war after damn war after war on the borders of Europe. In, in, in the Balkans in the 90s with Sarajevo and Croatia and Bosnia. Uh, we've seen what's happened in Ukraine, in the former Soviet Republic of Georgia. In a way, it's never stopped. The, I mean, I think of what's been going on as the wars of the Soviet succession. It's all what happened since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Yeah. And um, here is Putin trying to put Soviet power, if you like, or Soviet influence, Russian influence, back together, which is what happened with the Ukraine. And uh, don't forget that just shortly after the Russian or the Ukrainian rebels, the Russian-backed Ukrainian rebels, shot down uh, a civilian airliner, killing about 300 people, many of them Dutch holidaymakers, it wasn't long after that that we had Russian intelligence killing a Russian defector using a nerve agent in a placid English country town. And I thought, well, it's time to bring this theme into it as well about Russia. Because, as you know, I spent many years living in Russia as a correspondent in the years of Gorbachev and Perestroika. So I speak Russian, I like Russia, and I know Ukraine very well. So I bring that theme in as well. I always like to have more than one theme in my, in my books. And, uh, I, I want Bruno to have a little role in international great games, if you like. I think you've been very clever in the way that you have brought many larger issues. And, you know, the, the Bruno's town would otherwise be in danger of becoming like Cabot's Cove. Um, and, you know, as a, well, it would. And so you've, you've also, um, he's risen in his role. He's not just the chief of police of the small town at this point, but he has a much larger role. And yep. his failed romance um, does connect him to Paris and to security forces there. She's awfully useful. Isabel, yes, now that she's running the, uh, coordinating the anti-terrorism operations for the European Union. And yeah, I, but it, it turns out that this part of the world, this, the Perigord, is such a crossroads of international people. I mean, it's got, it's full of Brits, Dutch, Belgians, Germans, Scandinavians, so many people you know, come here uh, either for vacations or having second homes. Many of them come here to retire. It's a hugely international area. 
And uh, I was uh, I was very struck to realise that and to realise the implications of it for a novelist like me who has to keep on dreaming up new stories. By the way, I hope you noticed that I broke one of my great rules in in this particular novel. I've always sworn no direct sex scenes because I'm far too embarrassed at the thought of my daughters reading a sex scene written by their father. But I do have a sex scene yes, in this do. one, <laughs> except it's not human. It's time for Balzac to become a father. So Balzac has to mate with this lovely young female bassard called Diane de Poitiers, name of a, mess, a mistress of one of the French kings. So nothing but the best for Balzac. And uh, uh, in fact, um, we've been, I was making some arrangements today for my Balzac to uh, actually to lose his own virginity quite soon, and uh, we've picked out a rather attractive, rather attractive young uh, young Bassett lady for him, and uh, he's going to be. Uh, we're looking forward to Bassett to Balzac's puppies. Thought, it's a wonderful thing having a dog. It really is. Well, it is wonderful. I thought you did a very interesting job balancing the clinical details of of <laughs> the the two dogs mating uh, to produce a litter, um, and and a romantic element. So many people became involved in the thought that Balzac, you know, was going to become a father. Um, it became kind of a village thing, which I really enjoyed. Well, I mean, Balzac, my Balzac, is known to everybody in, in my town and in my village. I mean, everybody knows who he is. They know him better than they know me. Um, and yes, everybody's totally interested in um, who, he's going to be, who he's going to be mating with. And, uh, and in fact, He's going to be mating with the daughter of a local winemaker, so that, that means the, uh, I, I think the, the vibes are good for that. <laughs> it sounds wonderful. Well, you do, if you decide that Hector too needs to become a father, you have um, a, a higher bar of horses being perhaps more difficult in, in this well, than dogs. Of course, Hector, I made the mistake of making Hector a gelding when, uh, ah. when Bruno first got him, so and that can't actually take place, but maybe with, we can do something with the Andalusian. And don't forget that, uh, oh no, it's the book that's coming next. No, it's in this one, that a foal, a foal is born at uh, Pamela's, uh, Pamela's riding stable. So, uh, yeah, we, we even have horses being born and so on. It's, uh, it's a very fertile area around here. I have to wonder, you won't answer me, I'm sure, but I do have to wonder, since Bruno would really love to have a family, he has a sort of ready-made family right there at hand, and you just gave a little riffle of it in this book and caused Pamela to have a, a little susan of, um, of jealousy, but I've, I've often thought that might be the direction it goes, but then you bring in Isabel and Bruno goes, you know, but she's really the love of my life. How long are you well, going to do this? Well, you've met Julia, you're my wife, and you know, she, you know she's a very smart woman who had a great deal to do with the whole Bruno saga. I mean, it was when I wrote the first one, it was Julia who said, now, this is interesting, but publishers really like a series, so go away and write five paragraphs to summarize each of the next five books in the series you're going to write. So Julia's been involved from the beginning, and Julia has always said to me, every time I suggest just what you said, that isn't it time for Bruno to find the real woman of his life and settle down? But she said, oh, you don't understand. The moment Bruno settles down, you will lose half your readers. So, I don't know, what do you think? Do you think she's right? No, um, and I don't really huh? think it's so much about the women is that I think that Bruno cries out for children. Um, he does. I think that's the hard part. It isn't so much that, um, and you know, it, 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 I'm not sure at this point, he's so, he spends so much time with the children in the village, you know, he, he, in this one it's the tennis coach role, but he has, um, you know, lots of responsibilities with the young people in the village, and I, I'm beginning to feel sorry for him that he has no children of his own, uh, and instead is busily raising everybody else's. So I think that's really the bar that you have to consider at some point. But you know what, they're your books, not mine. So <laughs> I don't really get to well, decide. My older, my older daughter has, a, has her own scheme. She says that what I have to do now is to write the last Bruno novel 
which we will hold off, in which Bruno gets married, finds the woman, realizes who the right woman is, gets married, she's pregnant when they're married, when they get married, and then Kate says, at that point, Dad, you give the novel to me, I will put it to one side and we'll publish it when you're finally dead. So it'll be a posthumous ending to the Bruno series. And I thought, well, thanks a lot, Kate, but uh, I'm not sure that's really a great idea. The younger generation can be really quite ruthless. True, and that's just so Agatha Christie, I'm not at all sure. <laughs> you know, which is what she did, of course, with Poirot. So um, you'd be following in her footsteps. Let's revert back to Chateau Rock, uh, because we've, we've yeah. talked about the fact that you have this Scottish um, musician and, and his yeah. family um, and his children who are classical, he's a budding classical star, and his girlfriend, who um, is the daughter of, of a Russian, or, yeah, he is a Russian, but with Cypriot citizenship. And she is a flautist, if I recall. Is that right? That's right. Right. Yeah. And so they're clearly going in a classical bin. But, but what also is important to Bruno and the area is the vineyard that they have established at the chateau. And, you know, there's a lot of concern in the commune about what will happen. It's an investment. In fact, Bruno's put his whole life savings into this commune, I mean, into the vineyard that the commune is operating there. So. It isn't that if they sell the chateau, it isn't just about a, a real estate transaction. There's a huge amount of other considerations at stake in which you bring in. But parallel Absolutely. to that, you have got the old farmer and his decision about whether he will sell the farm and invest in a very luxe yeah. retirement home, which I have to tell you, I thought was a brilliant piece of fraud on your part. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> well. The, um, the fact is that we've had so many people retiring to this part of France, to the, to the Perigord region, that something like uh, one in one in seven of the population is over 70 years old in the, in the Perigord. And there has been a mushrooming of retirement homes, most of them run by the French state, the French people. But we're starting to see these genuinely luxurious international ones coming up. Now, I'd be interested in that because it was very fine, very difficult to find out who actually owned them. And I was very struck a couple of years ago when a Maltese journalist called, called Caruana was blown up, was killed, because of her investigations into mainly Russians but some other nationalities buying themselves European citizenship in Malta and in Cyprus. Basically, passports had been for sale to people prepared to pay enough. And quite a lot of Russians have taken advantage of this, and quite a lot of, of rather shadowy insurance and finance companies, which, uh, when you go back through the shell companies, turn out to be Russian owned, uh, are now operating throughout Europe in basically in areas that are very friendly to foreign capital like Luxembourg, Cyprus, Malta, and Monaco. And uh, so I decided to put all of this together. I mean, I was outraged by the murder of this woman journalist. Um, and I decided to put all this together. And so what we have is this old sheep farmer who dies and his son turns up, this is in the first chapter, turns up to see Bruno and says, my sister and I have been disinherited. We went to bury my dad, then we went to the lawyer. There is nothing left. He signed away everything to this insurance company that said they would put him up in this luxurious retirement home for the rest of his life, and he's dead before he can go there. And there's no money left. And so Bruno starts to investigate, initially because Bruno gets outraged that when he goes up to this old sheep farmer's farm, the new owners, the insurance company, they've just done nothing about the sheep and the lambs and the sheepdogs and the chickens. They just let them there starve. And Bruno just goes apoplectic at this and starts launching uh, legal procedures against them for cruelty to animals and so on, just as you imagine Bruno would do. And then he starts realizing it could, looks as though it's even more dirty and suspicious than, than he thought it was. And um, off we go into the dark and dirty plot that runs through the novel, along with the music and along with the 
my, the romance of Balzac and so on. And my one of my favorite characters, the mayor. The mayor comes back because, in fact, the weaponry that Bruno unleashes against his people is French bureaucracy. And I thought, you have really mastered it because, you know, you, it's like death by a thousand pinpricks or something when you get going. So I thought it was well, masterful. So, well, something that I've learned here is that um, there's a, a holiday village not far from not far from me where people will come and you know, rent, a, rent a house for a couple of weeks. And quite often they're from Paris and they will complain uh, to me and to other people who own chickens around here about the noise of our cockerels waking them up at dawn. And you know, initially we just said, well, look, you're in the countryside. You've got to expect cockerels and chickens and being woken at dawn. And one of them actually brought a legal case against one of my neighbors. And it fell apart because we are living in what is called uh, an agricultural or an agrarian commune. That is to say, everybody in this particular commune has got the right to keep goats, chickens, geese, donkeys, horses. We're agricultural, and there is nothing that any of these Parisians can do about it. So I wanted to bring this sort of idea in as well. The, the role of, a, of an agrarian commune in France is very, very particular in the law. And equally, an agrarian lease, if you're leasing agricultural land, oh, that's a very special arm of the law. And however fancy and expensive your Parisian lawyer may be, he's going to need a local guy through this particular thicket of the French bureaucracy. So yeah, I had huge fun getting to know about all of this. I could tell, so did Bruno. Let me check with Pat and see if we have any questions from people watching. Uh, we have a question. Uh, I don't think he can hear you over oh. there. He's going to have to come over here. Come on this around. This is Pat who's Hello. helping me, so he's going to read questions hey, to you. All right. Hello there. So Faith Clover wants to know uh, when we're going to see a Bruno cookbook in this country. Yes! We have great news, which is that Knopf, who publish, um, uh, who published the Bruno novels in the States, uh, said that they want now to bring out a Bruno cookbook and Julia and I, my wife and I, have been in this two and a half months of lockdown. We have been working together remotely to put it together. So it's going to be, it's going to be uh, different from the original German cookbook, and we hope it'll be rather better. So yes, it will be coming, and I think it's coming next year. But it depends how quickly Klopf can work, given that they're all on lockdown too, and they're all working remotely and and with Zoom and so on. That's very exciting. Yeah, um, what, what's going on with TV? Because the TV for Bruno Yin is German. Yep. Ufa Film Studios, uh, they've now got the first three scripts. I've seen them. They're doing uh, a whole series of seven uh, TV shows. And we're waiting for them to get out of lockdown and start working. It's, uh, the, uh, they've already sent their, what's the name, the locations people here to find out where exactly they're going to be shooting. And um, I was a little tempted to say, well, why not use this place? But no, I think it would be just too disruptive. And, uh, well, in truth, lockdown and social distancing has worked well for writers, but um, for other creative people, it's presented a tremendous number of obstacles. It's been, actually, it's been, I, I'd have thought it would be easy for writers, but it's not. Um, as you realize, I mean, so much of what I write in Bruno is inspired by what I know of the local area and what I learn from local people. And so this lockdown has been a bit of a problem. I've been kept sane by my garden. And if anybody who sees my stuff on Facebook, I put, put a lot of photos up of my, of my garden. And it's um, the garden, the dog, and uh, the, the, the wonderful weather that we've had have just been holding me together. And of course, working with Julia, but it's, it's really tough being uh, alone, even in a sort of little paradise. Where I am lucky is that in our little hamlet, I've got some great neighbors and we, we will tend to meet up of an evening for a drink at, one, at my big table, where we can all be about a meter apart from one another, so we're legal, sort of. Uh, and anyway, the local cop is a good friend, so uh, uh, I'm not too worried about that. And it, we've now relaxed things. so. This last week, 
with one of my neighbours, Raymond, the retired gendarme. He and I regularly go off wine tasting together. So we went down to the area around uh, Aimé and Issyjac in the southeast of the Perigord, uh, tasting wines at half a dozen vineyards and feeling that life was slowly getting a bit back to normal. We were allowed to travel within our department um, and to go no more than 100 kilometres, about 60 miles from our home. Um, and so it's much easier than it was. But of course, we have to wear a mask when we're out outdoors, the, when we're out in public. The difficulty is trying to taste wine while wearing a mask. So we just gave up. We didn't wear our masks inside. Well, I think that's the big question facing restaurants reopening and bars. You know, you can wear a mask when you get there, but uh, until you get there, and then there you are. I, you know, I'm so interested that um, Americans just don't seem to be able to adjust to that kind of um, enforcement. So, except in New York, where Governor Cuomo seems to, you know, have been quite powerful, but. Here in Arizona, maybe it's the spirit of the West, uh, we did have a, a lockdown, but uh, I'm not seeing people paying a lot of attention to it at the moment. Pat, are there any other questions? Um, not at the moment, no. Okay. Um, anything else you'd like to say, Martin? It's been really a treat well, to visit with you again. It's been great fun. I, we've got a restaurant here that has installed what I can only describe as enormous transparent light shades over each individual seat in the restaurant. So you you go in and you sit down and this light shade comes around around you and it's big enough so that you can move your you can move your arms and eat and so on and they can slide the plate underneath it to feed you. But you've got this great big plastic mask between you and everybody else at the table. So French ingenuity is coming through again and uh, I'll be going there next week to uh, to have a, a dinner cooked by somebody else. Or I have had a lot of fun cooking of late. It's been great. Even been making my own hummus and uh, other dishes. It's, it's been good. Well, it's fortunate that you are such a good cook. And so, whoop, another question. Another question snuck in. Martin, yeah. one of uh, our audience members wants to know, the first published book that you have was in 2008. Given changes yeah. in the world in the last decade, do you feel any differences in the way you approach writing a book now? Um, yes, I do. Um, I mean, I, at some point, I'm going to have to bring in things like Brexit or Britain leaving the European <laughs> Union. I'm probably going to have to bring in uh, some other themes, but I've already, I've already tried to link my books to quite a lot of local events. So. When we had this burst of terrorism in France, the attack upon the Charlie Hebdo magazine, the attack upon the nightclub in Paris, the attack upon the, the, the truck driving through the crowds to kill people deliberately in Nice, uh, when all that happened, I, mean, I was bringing in international terrorism as a theme into the novels because it was there, it was just real. And with this novel, I brought in what I see as this very aggressive and very manipulative and indeed uh, financially dirty operation of some Russian black money or some Russian dark money. So I do try and respond to that. The difficulty is that what I really like writing about is the Perigord and um, the way of life that has seduced me and so many other people with the food, with the drink, with the the history with the chateaus, with the cave paintings. I mean, it really is a paradise on earth around here. Truly it is. Um, you mentioned that you have finished another book, so um, we can expect that one next year? It is. I'm just I've just been working on the, uh, on the editing, the final edits of it. Uh, it's going to be called The Coldest Case, and it uh, is the case that Jean-Jacques, Bruno's friend, who's the head of detectives, could never solve. It was uh, the discovery of the body of somebody buried in a forest near here, found by a dog, and they have to try and identify who it is. And for 30 years, they were never able to find out who this dead person might be. And um, 
Well, I thought it's time to have this cold, this case cold case inquiry. And off we go. I had great fun with this one. I really did. And uh, I've got to tell you, I have. I hope. I hope people, readers, have as much fun reading the books as I do writing them, because I like every every aspect of it. I like doing the research. I like the actual writing. I like cooking, because every single every single dish that appears in the Bruno books, I've had to cook myself. Normally, with Julia standing at my shoulder. And poor you, you've had to drink the wine as well. <sighs> I'm glad you reminded me. Barbara, yes. you're very, very good health. <laughs> and to you as well. So I will say au revoir. If you get a chance to travel and come visit us, that would be great. Um, I, I hope that next book we won't be doing this on the same Zoom channel. But, you know, as long as I we can't wait to touch. get back in Scottsdale. And yeah. here's, here's Barbara's that I come to say goodbye to everybody. Oh. Yeah. Adieu, Baza. I love you, boy. A bientôt. A bientôt. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.